As someone who's reviewed a few of the vehicles from the Volkswagen Group, I was intrigued to see how the Seat Leon e-hybrid would compare to the Audi A3 TFSI e, which I recently reviewed. If you want to see a review of the Audi, by the way, it'll be up on your pop-up banner. Now, the Seat Leon e-hybrid, which is a little bit of a mouthful to say, comes in at roughly £33,000. The trim that we've got over here is the baseline trim for the hybrid variant, and that is the FR model. You can find an FR Sport, and there's the Excellence as well. Now, if you'd like a detailed breakdown between the different trim levels, do check out our written review, which goes into far more detail. It'll be down in the description below, and also down there you'll find links to our social media platforms, and furthermore, if you want to keep up with the channel, definitely do subscribe and hit that bell notification. Now, jumping straight into it, we're going to talk about its exterior design. And while it isn't as alluring as its Audi counterpart, I still think the Seat Leon e-Hybrid definitely does look great on the road. From its front, it's got a little bit of an aggressive design, from its flared bonnet to its LED headlights. At the side of the vehicle, you've got body-coloured wheel arches and side skirts, and 17-inch alloys that come as standard. I also like the fact that the wing mirrors are fold-in, so they're electronically adjustable, and of course fold-in when you go away from the vehicle. Again, all of this comes as standard. At the back of the vehicle, you then have got a quite nice, stylish look, which is also sporty. Now, I should mention that there are some fake exhaust outlets, so those purists out there will be a little bit upset, but frankly, for most people, I don't think they're really going to be batting an eyelid, and here I just think the fake exhaust outlets just give that extra sort of sporty flair. Now, unlike the Audi, the Seat comes in a variety of different colours, and all of which can be customised to your heart's content. Well, for the selections that you've got at least through Seat's website or via Seat's dealerships. And here, they all come as standard. You don't have to pay an extra premium if you want to personalize the look of it. So if you don't like the silver look, you can go for a red color instead or a blue color. It's just nice to see that this all comes as standard and therefore means that, well, you don't have to pay extra in order for you to kind of personalize the car to your own tastes. Now, transitioning inside the vehicle, there are yet again quite a few differences between the Seat and its Audi counterpart, whereby I would say the A3 just looks and feels a little bit more premium both in terms of the overall finish and in terms of its technology integration and we'll touch upon in that in just a bit although I should say that its two-tone fabric design that stretches around all five seats is well quite young looking and quite sporty in some respects specifically given it's got a red stitching now the tech side of stuff is a little bit more disappointing while it's great to see a 10 inch infotainment system as standard in all the hybrid trims and that the display is slightly angled towards the driver making for a little bit of easier interactions with it and the fact that it also does integrate Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, it's a shame to see the infotainment system itself is quite a quite bit sluggish. Even transitioning within menus on Android Auto, so for example, if I'm going between Google Maps and let's say Power Amp, there's a little bit of a lag that can be felt. Similarly, if you're going through the vehicle settings or the climate settings, I just felt that there was just a little bit more of a delay than there should be. Whereas on the Audi A3, there was absolutely no delay whatsoever. So in terms of the graphic or processing power that they have in the Audi, it seems to be a little bit better than the one in the Seat and or the fact that the firmware is just not as well optimized. Now, should you want to connect up to the infotainment system, there are two USB Type-C ports found at the front of the center console. Of course, you will need to get a Type-C to Type-A adapter if you don't have the appropriate cable. And furthermore, there are two Type-C ports found at the rear of the center console, including the climate controls, and this will be useful for rear occupants. Although I should say the rear two are just used for charging only. Now, else where you do have Bluetooth connectivity and only the SPC codec is supported. Now, why is this of importance? Well, it's if you want to play back some music and here you've got seven speakers that come as standard in the Seat Leon e-Hybrid. Now, if you'd like a dedicated audio review of the vehicle itself, do check it up on your pop-up banner or indeed in the description below where I'll go into a lot more detail of how the audio system performs. What I will say in a nutshell is that it's a decent performer and will definitely keep those people excited. On that note, if you want to adjust the volume of the overall system there is a capacitive touch button that's found just underneath the 10 inch display and here I just feel it's a little bit more excessive than it needed to be. I know this is present on the VW ID3 so I can see where this has come from but it's not really that well appreciated. I preferred the sleek and stylish control
control wheel that found, was found on the Audi A3. It not only felt a little bit more premium, but was just a little bit more responsive. Instead here, you're gonna be having to faff around with some capacitive buttons by the infotainment system. And the same goes with the climate controls as well. There's no physical buttons for you to use. And given the fact that the infotainment system on the whole is just a little bit sluggish, it means that it does even take some time to respond on the screen. So depending on your adjustments. Now on the plus side, the Spanish automaker has retained physical buttons on the steering wheel. Although I do find it a little bit odd that you have the volume wheel on the left hand side next to the cruise control buttons. And on the right hand side, you've got the media control. So previous and next, next to the instrument cluster controls. Although it's a very small point to make, but something that you might just have to get used to. Behind the steering wheel, you've got two flappy paddles, which allows you to flick through the six-speed DSG gearbox, and we'll touch upon this further down in this review. And behind the steering wheel, you've got a 10.25 inch fully digitalized instrument cluster. Now here, it can be customized, whereby you can flick through different menus, and furthermore, go through the different screens that are available to you. And here, personally, I think it's just done really well. Yet again, however, there's a little bit of a delay when flicking through the different menus, although I can't see many people going through the different instrument cluster designs once they've found their preferred one and they just use that one as their daily driver. Now following on from that and specifically going on to the subject of practicality, it's great to see that the manufacturer has integrated a wireless charging pad and that again comes as standard. It's found at the front of the center console but yet again there is a little bit of a delay before your phone actually accepts a wireless charge, at least in my case with the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. Now in terms of storage you have then got quite a nice amount of storage that's been aligned. You've got two cup holders by the center console and some place to put some loose change. And within the armrest, which is also adjustable, so depending on how you want to adjust it, you will also find a 12 volt socket. So for example, if you want to plug in a dash cam. And by the way, if you're looking for a round off of the best dash cams, no matter in terms of your price range, do check it out in the description below where we've listed out some of our favorites. Now, aside from the center console, you do of course have the glove box and you've got two relatively large door bins. So here you can fit a 500 milliliter bottle alongside, let's say a large size purse or a wallet. The rear door bins, however, are a little bit more limited in terms of the overall space. Now, the big thing over here is its boot capacity, and it's down by around 100 litres from its non-hybrid equivalent. Here, you're going to be treated with 270 litres of usable space when the seats are up, and if you were to put them down, this extends up to 1,191 litres. It's great to see, however, that the Spanish automaker has retained a 40-60 split, and furthermore, allows you to pop down the middle seat without obstructing, let's say, the two rear occupants, and allows you to, let's say, take a set of elongated goods. So for example, a pair of skis. This just makes quite use of practicality. And furthermore, if you don't have a rear occupant in the middle seat, what you'll find is that you can bring down the middle seat and therefore use it as an armrest instead, where you'll also find two cup holder spaces. Now, speaking of the rear of the cabin, it's very spacious. I'm just on the six foot and I've got plenty of headroom and legroom, which is just a great thing to see. Furthermore, the seating height is just natural and you just don't feel too kind of hemmed in. If you're someone who's going to be six foot four to six foot seven, I think you'll still feel quite comfortable at the rear of the cabin, let alone at the front of the cabin where you've got manually adjustable seats. It is unfortunate to see not electronically adjustable seats, nor can you see it even as an option, which is the same that could be said about the Audi A3, although the latter vehicle does offer the option of getting fully adjustable electronic seats. Now, as for the comfort of the seats themselves, aside from the middle rear seat, which is unsurprisingly a little bit stiff, the seats themselves are pretty cushiony and I had no issues whatsoever sitting on longer distance drives. And furthermore, the fact that you do have that adjustment at the front means that you can find the best sort of seating height and give you the best sort of riding comfort. Now, this perfectly leads me on to cabin noise. And right now we're at the side of a motorway, or should I say dual carriageway, and you might be able to hear the cars going by. I'm not really sure if my microphone will pick it up, but at least in person, the cabin is not that well insulated. And furthermore, when we're gonna set going on a drive, 
you'll be able to hear some road noise that creeps in. Be it if you're going at, well, a leisurely pace, so for example, 20 miles an hour, or if you were to then floor it and you're going at pace, you'll hear a lot more road noise creeping into the cabin, which does detract from the overall experience. Now, while the Audi A3 TFSI was not a saint in this department either, I do feel that on the whole, it does a slightly better job at giving you an insulated cabin in comparison to, well, the Seat Leon e-Hybrid. Now, when it comes to its suspension setup and handling characteristics, the vehicle itself isn't too bad for driving around the city. If, however, you're going to be driving around country roads, what you'll find is that its suspension is a little bit softer than the Audi and therefore means that you do suffer from a little bit of body roll. As a result, it means that the car just doesn't feel as well planted on the ground and doesn't give you that confidence. The same could be said about the overall grip that you get. Now, as this runs a front wheel drive system and unsurprisingly, very much like the Audi A3, what you'll find is that you get a bit of front wheel spin. Although I did notice it's a little bit more present on the Seat in comparison to the Audi, whereby no matter the road conditions, when I was putting my foot down on the ground, specifically doing my 0 to 60 tests, I found that the car was slipping at, in terms of its front wheels and just struggling for grip which again doesn't give you the best confidence specifically if you live in somewhere like in the UK where you've got a lot of rain and therefore traction might be a little bit of an issue now, as we're gonna get onto the motorway let's talk about the overall power and again it's no surprise that it pretty much shares the same as the Audi A3 at least on paper it's got a front mounted 1.4 liter engine which combined with its 12.8 kilowatt hour battery pack dispatched 150 kilowatts of power which equates to 201 horsepower. This gives you 350 newton meters of torque, which is in effect at certain RPM, of course, because it's got the engine power as well that needs to kind of ramp up as well. But in terms of a tor tested 0 to 60 time, I had it at 7.04 seconds, which guess what the Audi A3 got? 7.03 seconds so yeah if it if your 0 to 60 time is really important then um, the Audi will be the most important I'm, I'm only joking if it really is important then an all-electric vehicle will definitely give you a better experience and will give you a little bit of funner drive but for a plug-in hybrid at a car of its price I think it's perfectly acceptable and again here it goes like for like with the Audi A3 TFSIE now as for top speed this will suffice for a lot of individuals but here you get up to 137 miles an hour and if you're going to be driving in all electric mode you're limited to 85 miles an hour now here unlike the Audi this means that if you're going to be driving on the German Autobahn or somewhere that's unlimited or unrestricted then its Audi counterpart does a slightly better job because it gets to around 140 miles an hour both in EV or in petrol mode or in hybrid mode should we say now on that subject in terms of EV and the petrol mode the seamless transition that you have is absolutely fantastic. I must say, in comparison to other vehicles out there that use hybrid systems, the Seat does a phenomenal job. Unsurprisingly, so did the Audi, and it's something that I very much shouted about when it came to doing its review, because I was just so impressed as to how it just goes between going through an all-electric powertrain and a um, pa uh, petrol powertrain and the fact that you don't even feel it when you're in the cabin other than you know hearing the engine which is trickling away at the front you don't actually feel that transition kicking in and it's so seamless that you can do it a multitude of times and still not have to worry about the vehicle's ECU doing its job. Now on that subject I should mention the gears and here you've got a 6-speed DSG gearbox and what I found here is that it's not as seamless as the Audi A3 because you do feel a little bit of lag when you're going through certain gears namely the second and third and third and fourth gears the rest of the gears seem to be pretty faultless but there's a slight delay and that's only when you are on manual mode and when I say manual mode that's using the flappy paddles on the steering wheel and when you're on sport mode so for example like now 
If, however, you just want the car to do its thing, you shift down on the gear selector found on the center console, and be it on drive or sport mode, which will therefore keep the, um, the revs a little bit higher and make you feel that you've got a little bit more power at your disposal, what you'll find here is the car does a great job in determining what gear it should be in and does a phenomenal job in this respect. Now on the subject of electric power, of course, I have to mention its electric range. And here you've got a 12.8 kilowatt hour battery pack, which is found towards the rear of the vehicle, more specifically towards the boot. Now here, Seat claimed that you get 37 miles on a single charge, whereas from my experience, that's sat around 25 miles. Of course, it just depends on how you drive because there's an element of regenerative braking and depending on where you're driving, electric power will be potentially a bit more efficient than relying on its petrol engine. So for example, with an inner city commute. Now, of course, you don't have to rely on its all electric power only. You can run it in hybrid mode and therefore let it intelligently switch between the two modes. Or of course, you can run it on purely electric mode where if you're gonna be doing commutes that are under, amount, under that amount, then it will allow you to save a little bit money on your refueling costs because, well, effectively recharging is cheaper. Now, I should mention in terms of recharging the car, it only accepts up to 3.6 kilowatts of input and therefore will take upwards of around three hours to charge from zero to empty. Although I don't suspect many people will be doing that, but it's just worth bearing in mind that if you're gonna go on a longer drive, let's say on a motorway, and you want to recharge quickly, well, you've only got a type two input to use and you don't have, let's say, a CCS input for you to benefit from, let's say, a 50 kilowatt charger. But given the size of the battery pack, this is also expected, but potentially might put off some people because effectively you need to recharge overnight in order to maximize the electric range because without it, then you're gonna to have to be waiting a long time at a charge point. Now, other than plugging it in, you can, of course, recoup energy via regenerative braking. And here it's done automatically. There's no allowance for you to uh, customize it or tailor it to your liking. So therefore you can't quite get a one pedal driving approach. However, still it does recoup energy relatively efficiently and it does so automatically or when you are applying pressure to the brake pedal as you might expect. So this allows you to harvest energy back into the battery pack and therefore trying to maximize that electric range. So therefore, as I mentioned, 25 miles, you might get more because you might drive in and around the city, whereas in the tests that I do, it's around the city, motorway, and on country roads. So it's a little bit of a mix of all different road scenarios. Now, other than its electric portion, of course, it's got a fuel tank, and here you've got 40 liters. It's a petrol vehicle, as I've mentioned before, and here in terms of fuel efficiency, the Leon E Hybrid actually scores around 55 miles per gallon, which is very impressive for a car of its class. In fact, unsurprisingly, the Audi A3 did pretty much the same amount. So it's great to see both cars share good fuel efficiency. So even though if you do run out of um, electric juice, then you've effectively got a pretty efficient engine to take you the distance as well, which will be very useful for those people who are doing longer commutes on the motorway. Now speaking about driving on the motorway, in the unlikelihood of you having a serious accident, you should be pleased to know that this has a five out of five stars on Euro NCAT's pretty rigorous 2020 testing methodology. As a result, the child and adult occupancies are both excellent. Now, I should also mention there are a lot of driver assistance systems that are at your disposal, and they all come as standard, which is great to see. Again, not something that could be said about its Audi counterpart, which has a lot of options added on top. Now, the safety systems that you should be most concerned about, or shall you, that you probably use the most, is to do with adaptive cruise control, which will regulate your speed really intelligently and will pick up these signs in terms of uh, traffic road sign recognition and therefore adjust its sign on the fly. And furthermore, with the car in front of you using its sensors. As for lane assistance, this is another feature which I found extremely useful because the lane assistance feature allows you to keep in lane and does a phenomenal job at steering you accordingly. 
So therefore you don't feel like you are, well, having to battle with the steering wheel each time. And also you don't feel that the car is just kind of like a pedestrian, not really doing much. In other words, just keeping you to lane departure warning like the Audi did. Instead here, you've got pretty much, not say autonomous driving, but you have to keep your hands on the wheel, but you can then trust it to do its thing and keep you centered in the lane. And furthermore, keep its distance from the car in front of you and pair this up with adaptive cruise control means that you've got a really pleasurable experience when you're taking the car on the motorway. Now, if you do not like lane assist, you'll be disappointed to learn that it has to be disabled each time you step inside the vehicle. And as a result means that you have to faff around with the infotainment system or go through the appropriate menu on the instrument cluster. There's no physical button found on the dashboard that would allow you to traditionally do this, which would have been the case in older vehicles. Now on a more positive note, a safety feature I really do like is the blind spot monitoring system. And that appears on an LED strip found within the cabin where normally you'd find it, let's say planted on a side view mirror. The inclusion here is subtle, but very, very handy when it comes to checking your blind spots. And therefore means you have to, well, less regularly have to look over your shoulder and just makes for a better experience, specifically when you're driving on the motorway and you're doing a lane change and there's a car beside you, it will notify you of that. Now elsewhere, you do have front and rear parking sensors, which makes parking a little bit easier in comparison to not having the sensors altogether. Although it is a shame, very much like the Audi A3, not to see a rear view camera camera installed as standard. Here's something I was expecting to see at to kind of one up its Audi sibling. Unfortunately, you'll have to spend upwards of £35,000 to get the excellence trim. And therefore here, you'll then get a rear view camera. So it's a shame that it's not, it doesn't come as standard because it might put off a few people. But on the flip side, visibility is fantastic, both at the rear view in terms of the front and in terms of the side where the A pillars themselves are relatively thin. It makes for driving just very easy. And indeed, if you're going to be parking the vehicle, well, kind of second nature. Now on the subject of parking, the car does also come with a feature called park assist. Now, while it isn't exactly that useful when it comes to finding a parking space and actually scanning for availability, it does do a decent job when it does work. And here you're gonna to have to apply pressure to the brake pedal and the accelerator pedal when you're doing a parking maneuver, because generally speaking, it is going to require you a lot more interaction in comparison to automated parking systems out there. So as a result, it does take a stress away a little bit, but equally doesn't mean that you can be kind of a pedestrian when you are uh, parking the vehicle because you're still gonna have to check your surroundings. And often I found that if I wasn't to apply, let's say pressure on the brake pedal, it would just tell me to continue reversing and effectively hitting a car. So make of it what you will. And I don't know if you're gonna be some, this is gonna be a feature that you're actually gonna use, but for those people who don't feel confident in parking, I think it's a decent inclusion. And so this all leads me onto my verdict. And quite frankly, the Seat Leon e-Hybrid is very similar to its Audi counterpart, the A3 TFSIE. Hopefully I've drawn quite a few comparisons for you guys so you can make up your own mind as to the differences between the two vehicles. But fundamentally, the Seat offers a lot more features as standard, a bit from the color options that you get or indeed its safety features. Whereas its Audi counterpart is a lot more stylish, at least subjective from the exterior and is a lot more advanced in terms of the technology it offers inside the cabin. And furthermore, the Audi, I would say, is a little bit of a better drive. In other words, its handling characteristics are just a little bit more tailored towards spirited driving on the country roads. Now, you should also consider that these are plug-in hybrids, which cost around 33 to 34,000 pounds. And at this price category, you should consider that there are all electric vehicles out there on the market from the Volkswagen group themselves. The ID3, for example, is a fantastic all-around electric vehicle. And then you've got the likes of the Renault Zoe and the Nissan Leaf, which are in the same category. Or if you are not looking for a vehicle that goes over 200 miles on a single charge and 130 to 150 miles would suffice, then you should definitely consider the Seat Mi Electric or the VW E-Up, which are two of my personal favorite budget all electric vehicles. But of course, that's just my thoughts and opinions about them. So do let me know in the comment section below as to what you make of the vehicles. And furthermore, if a hybrid or an electric vehicle is right for you. 
Now, if you like this video, give it a like. And of course, if you want to see more from the channel, definitely do subscribe and hit that bell notification. It's greatly appreciated. All right, I've been Chris from Total EV. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.